Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is John Highbush. I have the honor of being the executive director of the Reagan Presidential Foundation. And I just want to thank each and every one of you for coming out this evening. Um, in honor of our men and women in uniform who protect our freedoms around the world, if you would please uh, stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Before we begin, I would like to welcome to the Reagan Library Craig Shirley's terrific and lovely wife, Zareen, who's here with us tonight. Zareen, if you please stand. Thanks. <clears throat> Each of us have probably been asked before, what season of the year is your favorite? Winter, spring, summer, fall. I like them all. Um, but the one season I cherish the most is what I'll call the Shirley season. It's that time of year, regardless of the temperature outside or the rain we might have recently seen, that Craig Shirley comes out with yet another terrific book about Ronald Reagan, our 40th president. Now, for those of you who have heard Craig speak here at the Reagan Library before, You've been treated to a real education by one of, if not the, most knowledgeable sources in the world on the life and times of Ronald Reagan. His best-selling books include Reagan's Revolution, the story of the 1976 election and how Ronald Reagan reshaped American politics for many years to come. Then there was Rendezvous with Destiny, the story of the 1980 election in which Ronald Reagan not only won the White House after many years of trying, but also gave rise to a new generation of conservatism. Then there was the last act, the one and only definitive account of President Reagan's life after leaving public office, including the last 10 years of his life. And finally, the most recent book by Craig, written about President Reagan, entitled Reagan Rising, the decisive years between 1976 and 1980, when Ronald Reagan emerged on the American stage once again, this time with a winning formula that involved a philosophy that would help shape the Republican Party and American politics to the present day. It is no secret that here at the Reagan Library, we sit atop many millions of documents from the Reagan presidency, as well as over 65,000 artifacts, some that we have on display in the museum. All of them are a terrific resource to have. But were it not for the expert historians and writers like Craig, so much of the material found here would never see the light of day. The research he's done and the stories that he has written inform us all about one of the most successful and admired presidents to hold office since Abraham Lincoln. Now, rather than give a formal speech, Craig has kindly agreed to sit with me and answer a few questions interview style about his newest book, as well as take some questions from you in the audience. I know that Reagan Rising is going to be another bestseller for Craig, one you will want to make room for on your bookshelf at home. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, if you would please join me in welcoming to the Reagan Library, Mr. Craig Shirley. Uh, 
Thanks. Well, Craig. It's a good looking book. It is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome back to the Reagan Library, Thank you. Craig. It's, it's just terrific to have you here. We are, uh, I can remember uh, sitting with you just a year or so ago uh, with the publication of, the mo of your previous to this most recent book. And each time that you come, it's uh, an education for me. I, you know, I travel a lot. And when I do, I, there's this expectation uh, that because I have the role of the executive director that, that I'll know every single conceivable fact and trivia piece of, of Ronald Reagan. And I, of course, I do not. I know a lot. I wish, I can only wish, that I knew 10% <laughs> what uh, Craig does about uh, President Reagan. Uh, so for me, it's just a treat to have you here, Craig. Likewise, so thanks thank again. You. Thank you. Um, you know, in des describing the books that you've uh, written to date, uh, you covered the 76 campaign, right. the 1980 campaign, um, and the years that uh, were present following the public service of President Reagan. Um, what is it about the time frame uh, of 1976 until 1980 that you thought, okay, well, that period has to be covered. What, uh, can you fill us in on that? Actually, the answer came from my son, Andrew. I was uh, working on the um, forward to the book. I'd finished it, and I was writing the forward to it. And uh, I was, I was, I asked him, I said, what do you think should, what, what is important about this? What do you think is important? He says, he said, um, there is a, a synchronicity to American history. He said, 200 years ago, in 1776, there was a sunburst of intellectual thought, you know, of Madison and Jefferson and Franklin and, uh, and Mason and so many others who were, ch many of them children of the Enlightenment, uh, and were defining new ways of looking at personal freedom, human freedom, rights, dignity, and privacy that hadn't been really thought of before, maybe since ancient Greece. Uh, and 200 years later, in, in the 1970s, America was experiencing a second intellectual conservative revolution because it's not just the rise of Ronald Reagan. There is the rise of so many conservative organizations and conservative writers and, uh, and initiative. Uh, you know, Prop 13 right here in California was, a, was a, a radical new way of looking at personal rights. You know, private property, ta private property taxes were out of control and everything was going to Sacramento. And uh, is that, the, the, you know, 20 years before, it would have been inconceivable that citizens would have taken action to stop the ever rising property taxes. And you say, okay, property taxes, is, it's, it's, it's just an issue. No, it's more than that. It's philosophical. And this is what Reagan understood. And this is why he re reordered the Republican Party organized around the concept of freedom. Um, in high school physics, um, when I didn't fall asleep. <laughs> I remember the teacher saying, power can neither be destroyed nor created, it can only be moved around. So if government has all the power, or a lot of it in the form of, 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 of wealth and prosperity, that means you don't have the power. So the way to achieve personal power is to take it away from government and give it back to the individual. This is what Reagan understood, is, is, that, is that the founders never intended for power to be concentrated in Sacramento or to be concentrated in Washington. It should be concentrated with the many individuals. And so there was this new type of thinking that was going on in the 1970s, and Ronald Reagan was right at the forefront. From 1976, the end of 76, until 1981 when he took office, he did 1,006 radio commentaries. And you read these, and they're, uh, uh, Kyron Skinner and um, Annalise uh, and Marty Anderson edited, and, I, and I'm sure it's for sale. In fact, I know it is. It's for sale here. Read it. Buy, buy it. Because these are writings that are worthy of the framers and the founders. This is, this is a man who quoted Cicero and Montesquieu and Paine uh, and so many leading intellectual uh, and Thoreau. Uh, he loved uh, 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 Thoreau. I uh, quoted him uh, frequently. 
he was, in many ways, a child of the Enlightenment. He certainly appreciated people who were children of the Enlightenment because the Enlightenment had, had been a, a sunburst of history, uh, just as it was in uh, Philadelphia short, a few short years or, 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 or later. Um, so it, is that Reagan is going through an awakening, but also so is America and so is the conservative movement. And I'm con convinced the 1970s are the linchpin of history, of American history, is that we'd had unquestioned uh, uh, force of government since the time of the New Deal is that the New Deal said government is good for you and then later it said well even more government is good for you and, and anything against government is anti-intellectual you know Lionel Trilling who was in many ways the official historian of the American left uh, wrote a book in the 1950s called The Liberal Imagination and in The Liberal Imagination he said that conservatism was just a, a, an irritable rash of grunts and gestures. Uh, and the 70s put that, to, put that phrase to, to the lie. As a matter of fact, intellectualism actually resided with American conservatism and not with American liberalism. That, that, had, that train had left for American liberalism years earlier. It was no longer about using a liberal philosophy to advance the, the, uh, the, the, the goods and the, uh, and the power of the individual. It had become just a corrupting force, or so many people thought. So the 70s are important because it changes people's ways of thinking about government, about power, about freedom, about, about uh, 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 personal rights. All this has changed because of the 1970s. And Reagan, of course, is one of the leading lights, if not the leading light leading the way. Got it. <clears throat> Long okay. answer, no. sorry. No, 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 no well, our, our punishment for your long answer is I'm going to ask you an unfair question. <laughs> uh, for everyone here uh, in the audience, uh, if they were allowed to read one book and only one book by Craig Shirley about Ronald Reagan, um, what one would you suggest and why? Well, I would say all of them, of course. No, no, no. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, John. I, I, I you know, I, I, <laughs> is that sometimes I'll pick up and reread Rendezvous because I enjoy that tubble, that struggle. Sometimes seventy six, uh, last act. I think. I think if you were gonna if you're gonna pick up one book right now and read it and you want to understand Ronald Reagan and what he was up against. It would be last act, because he brought out the best in uh, conservative liberals. Really, really, really didn't like Ronald Reagan. I mean, they really didn't, and it just drove them crazy that he never that they could not get his goat. You know, I mean, they can get Trump's goat. Let's face it, and they enjoy getting Trump's goat. They could never get Reagan's goat. But you know, I didn't realize until I started working on Last Act the depth to which many in the American left really didn't like Ronald Reagan. You know, the offices of New York City government uh, closed for the funeral, for the death and funeral of Franklin Roosevelt. They closed for the death and funeral of John Kennedy. They closed for the death and funeral of Lyndon Johnson. They closed for the death and funeral of Robert Kennedy. And they closed for the death and funeral of Martin Luther King Jr. The New York City offices did not close for the death and funeral of Ronald Reagan, which tells you the, 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 the depth of the pettiness that this man had to endure on the part of the American left. It was just, is, is that I would say read Last Act so you can realize what he w went up against for 50 years. And it all came out the week of his funeral. Nothing was, nothing was left. I mean, uh, is that the, the, so many of the newspapers wrote awful things about Ronald Reagan, even in his passing. Fortunately, that's not what is important to history. What's important to history is what he did. Um, I, I would say read Last Act. Um, I would say um, Reagan's Revolution because it, 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 it's the, it sets the stage for him running in 80 with him at the Kansas City Convention 76. Are we going to show, by the way, are we going to show that? Uh, the 76 speech? It's up to you, Craig, if you'd like to. Uh, uh, um, yeah, you know why? Because I think it's important um, to get people to understand what, how compelling he was. And, um, and, and uh, speaking of which, uh, the tape I want to show is Reagan's impromptu uh, speech at the end of the Kansas City Convention in 1976. Now, um, is that 
as you know, is, is that the battle, the nomination battle went right down to the wire. And the Republicans gathered in Kansas City not knowing who the nominee was, the, the nominee was going to be. It was either going to be Governor Ronald Reagan or it was going to be uh, the incumbent Gerald Ford. But it's the first time since 1952 there were Republicans gathered in a convention city not knowing the nominee was going to be Robert Taft or Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, is, and and um, it went, it, Ford wins the nomination by 67 delegate votes more than what he needs for a first ballot nomination. That's out of 2,269 votes cast. Reagan loses by 67 delegate votes. I mean, the, the, it's, and it was just as, uh, it was just as uh, uh, drama, it, it was all filled with drama, and it was, uh, it was, you know, there were fights and convention fights and floor fights and delegate fights and everything you can imagine. Um, I'm going to ask, was anybody in Kansas City in 1976? Yes, I know. My wife, Serene, was in Kansas City in 1976. <laughs> she was there on the campaign. Uh, and she was there the night Reagan gave this speech to 17,000. Now, let me just set this up. is that the fight is over. Ford has won the nomination, barely. There's so much animosity between the two warring camps, it's palpable. You know, the, the Reagan people don't like the Ford people. The Ford people don't like the Reagan people. Ford knows is that if he's got to have a chance against Jimmy Carter in the fall, he's got to have a unified party. Unified parties tend to win in the fall, divided parties tend to lose in the fall. If you think about recent history, is that in 64, the Democrats were united, the Republicans were divided. In 68, the Republicans were united, the Democrats were divided. In 72, the Republicans were united, the Democrats were divided. In 76, the Republicans are divided, the Democrats are united. In 80, the Republicans are united, the Democrats are divided. So it is that winning campaigns or uh, unified parties and conventions tend to win in the fall, Divided conventions and parties tend to lose in the fall. So Ford knows he's got to unify the party, and the only way to do it is to ask Ronald Reagan to come to the podium and speak to the 17,000 assembled there in, in Kansas City. Um, so uh, should we, do you want to watch it now? Yeah. Sure. Okay. We are all a part of this great Republican family that will give the leadership to the American people to win on November 2nd. I would like, I would be honored on your behalf to ask my good friend, Governor Reagan, to say a few words at this time. Mr. President, Mrs. Ford, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Vice President to be. <laughs> the distinguished guests here and you ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to say fellow Republicans here, but to those who are watching from a distance, all those millions of Democrats and independents who I know are looking for a cause around which to rally and which I believe we can give them. <laughs> Mr. President, before you arrived tonight, these wonderful people here, when we came in, gave Nancy and myself a welcome that that, plus this, and plus your kindness and generosity in honoring us by bringing us down here, will give us a memory that will live in our hearts forever. Watching on television these last few nights, and I have seen you also with the warmth that you greeted Nancy, and you also filled my heart with joy when you did that. <laughs> May I just say some words? There are cynics who say that a party platform is something that no one bothers to read and it doesn't very often amount to much. Whether it is different this time than it has ever been before, I believe the Republican Party has a platform that is 
a banner of bold, unmistakable colors with no pale pastel shades. We have just heard a call to arms based on that platform and a call to us to really be successful in communicating and reveal to the American people the difference between this platform and the platform of the opposing party, which is nothing but a revamp and a reissue and a running of a late, late show of the thing that we've been hearing from them for the last 40 years. If I could just take a moment and tell, I had an assignment the other day. Someone asked me to write a letter for a time capsule that is going to be opened in Los Angeles a hundred years from now on our tricentennial. It sounded like an easy assignment. They suggested I write something about the problems and issues of the day, and I set out to do so, riding down the coast in an automobile, looking at the blue Pacific out on one side and the Santa Ynez Mountains on the other, and I couldn't help but wonder if it was going to be that beautiful a hundred years from now as it was on that summer day. And then, as I tried to write, let your own minds turn to that task. You're going to write for people a hundred years from now who know all about us. We know nothing about them. We don't know what kind of a world they'll be living in. And suddenly, I thought to myself, if I write of the problems, they'll be the domestic problems of which the president spoke here tonight the challenges confronting us, the erosion of freedom that has taken place under Democrat rule in this country, the invasion of private rights, the controls and restrictions on the vitality of the great free economy that we enjoy. These are our challenges that we must meet. And then again, there is that challenge of which he spoke, that we live in a world in which the great powers have poised and aimed at each other horrible missiles of destruction, nuclear weapons that can in a matter of minutes arrive in each other's country and destroy virtually the civilized world we live in. And suddenly it dawned on me, those who would read this letter a hundred years from now will know whether those missiles were fired. They will know whether we met our challenge, whether they have the freedoms that we have known up until now will depend on what we do here. Will they look back with appreciation and say, thank God for those people in 1976 who headed off that loss of freedom, who kept us now a hundred years later free, who kept our world from nuclear destruction. And if we failed, they probably won't get to read the letter at all because it spoke of individual freedom and they won't be allowed to talk of that or read of it. This is our challenge, and this is why here in this hall tonight, better than we've ever done before, we've got to quit talking to each other and about each other and go out and communicate to the world that we may be fewer in numbers than we've ever been, but we carry the message they're waiting for. We must go forth from here united, determined that what a great general said a few years ago is true. There is no substitute for victory. Mr. President. Yeah, a, a couple things about this. Um, as I mentioned, you know, Zerina was there and I've asked her several times. And she said it was um, she, she had a tingly feeling. And there, a lot of people had that same feeling that night. Um, there was a, um, I interviewed uh, Kenny Kling, who was a field organizer for Reagan in 76. He had Florida and several other states. And he was standing on the floor of Kemper Arena next to a woman he described as a big time Ford supporter. And after Reagan is done giving a speech, she says to nobody in particular, but she says, so Kenny can hear, she said, oh my God, we've nominated the wrong man. Um, is what a great involving technique where he says, let your own minds turn to that task. That, what a great way to bring the audience in. I showed this speech some years ago to the head of the communications department at the University of Kansas. Um, I, her last name is Carlin. She'd been married to the Democratic governor 
Uh, but I showed this to her. And she, she was a liberal Democrat, but she said, I, I said, what did you think? She says, perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Perfect in cadence, perfect in delivery, perfect in tone, perfect in, in telling a moral story. Um, she said it was, it was a remarkably, unbelievably good speech by a losing presidential candidate. But this is the speech that, that sets him on the path to 1980 because uh, after this, he's going out and campaigning in the fall. He's, he's given speeches, he's campaigning for House candidates, Senate candidates. And there's uh, I, both Mike Deaver and, and Peter Hanford, who, were, were, who handled Reagan's schedule and all of his public relations at the time, uh, were both very good friends of mine. And they both said, because they would travel with Reagan as he went around the country, uh, and he would get into a cab, and the, and the cabbie would turn around and say, Governor, you've got to run one more time. You've got to do it again. And they'd get out of the cab, and the bellman at the hotel would say, Governor, you've got to run again. You've got to do it again. And then they'd walk across the street, and a cop would come up and say, Governor, you've got to run again. It was an enormous upswing in people who had seen the speech or had seen the campaign and heard Reagan's message, and I'm convinced that more than anything else convinced him to run again in 1980, more than uh, the political consultants, any polling data, any news reports, is that the average American people, the outpouring of, of, of just normal, everyday people coming up to say, oh, Governor, you've just got to do it one more time. Thank you, Craig. That's, yeah. um, uh, okay, now this next question is not uh, unfair, but it's similar to the last. <laughs> Um, is uh, okay. So you refuse to uh, select one of your books. Can you select a book uh, written by someone else uh, that you uh, would recommend if someone yes. really wants to get a, yes. a, a feel for Ronald Reagan? Yes. What, who, what book would that be? That would be uh, John Patrick Diggins, who passed away several years ago, became a friend of mine. He was um, he was in many ways the official historian for the American left in the 20th century. He wrote books about the labor movement, about the women's movement, environmental movement, civil rights movement. And he taught up here at Berkeley. And as a matter of fact, in the 60s, was part of the free speech movement that was doing battle with Governor Reagan. He, his last book, this liberal college professor, his last book is called Ronald Reagan, Fate, Freedom, and the Making of History. And in this book, this liberal historian says Reagan's one of our four greatest presidents. Because like Washington, Lincoln, and Franklin Roosevelt, he frees or saves many, many people. And he goes on to write eloquently and brilliantly making the case why Reagan is such an important figure of American history. Uh, so if I was going to recommend any book, and believe me, there are lots of great Reagan historians. Lou Cannon is terrific. I would urge you to read all of his books. Paul Kengor, Steve Hayward, Kyron Skinner, Annalise Anderson, Marty Anderson, they've all written very, very good books about Ronald Reagan. I would recommend all of them. But if I was going to pick one, it would be this one because it is so, because a, a, a liberal is writing this about, and he's a self-professed liberal, um, is that I think it's, it, when you're paid tribute by your political enemy, I think that means a lot. Yeah. Uh, uh, James McGregor Burns, the great historian, the great uh, of the of the Roosevelts, uh, himself is also a, a self-professed liberal. He said he would place Reagan in, in the great or near great category. So that's again great tribute from a from a liberal historian. So, but I would say I would say, fate, freedom, and the making of history. Great. Um, <clears throat> step out of the realm specifically of your book and just uh, ask a question now related to the present day. Uh, there's a lot of uh, talk in the media right now about comparisons between President Reagan and his first 100 days and uh, Donald Trump and his first 100 days. So uh, do you see any similarities in the men or in their vision and in their actions in that time frame? Well, they both have two ears. Okay. Two eyes. <laughs> Knows. Uh, both roughly the same age when yeah, office, right. right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Look, I, I suppose, John, is that, the, is that and, and you and I have written about this, uh, is that there are similarities, but more about the dynamics of history than about the men individually or his personality, is that Reagan was an outsider challenge to the status quo and challenge the Washington establishment before he was president and after he was president, right? I mean, he was always an outsider to Washington. You know, here's Reagan, who's head of the national government for eight years, and yet you never think of Reagan as being a part of Washington. You could, John Kennedy was head of the national government for three years and, and 11 months. 
Of course he was, he was part of Washington. Most pre Lyndon Johnson was part of Washington. Richard Nixon was part of Washington. Jimmy Carter ran as an outsider but quickly became a part of Washington. Is that the only president in recent memory that you can think of who is, who, even as he's head of the national government, you never think of him as being a part of the status quo is Ronald Reagan. And now I would say obviously the same goes through for Trump. So in that regard, they're similar. Is, is that they're both ran as outsiders. They're both threats to the establishment. And the establishment was very unhappy that both of them won. Um, and and uh, everybody expected Hillary to win right up to the day of the election. And one week before the 1980, everybody expected Jimmy Carter to win. It was only the last week of the election after Reagan's famous debate with Carter, uh, which, by the way, even 30 years later, is still the most watched debate in presidential history. And we've got 100 million more people in the country now than we did in 1980. But Reagan versus Carter drew 107 million people viewership which is basically every adult in America, uh, and, and uh, had a higher viewership than uh, Trump uh, versus uh, Hillary or Obama versus Romney or any of those. So I think it speaks a lot. Also, uh, his, uh, his inaugural was one of the most watched television events and uh, political events in American history. So Reagan was and remains a compelling figure of American history. President Trump and the Republican Party just uh uh, lost a big one in, yes. in the form of a, a vote, or well, actually no vote on the health care debates and Obamacare and all that. Uh, so uh, President Trump, at least legislatively, uh, in his first 100 days, right. lost a big one. Right. Uh, compare that to Reagan. What was happening? At the, did uh, President Reagan accomplish um, any, major, any major legislative yeah, achievement sure. in his first his tax cuts, days. his budget cuts, don't forget he was shot, almost died. Now some historians will say that Reagan would not have achieved his legislative agenda without being shot and how graceful he was after being shot and how graceful he was in recovery. I'm not so sure, I'm not so sure that's true. I do think that that was a point where the American people saw Reagan in a, in, a, in a deeply personal way that they hadn't seen him before, and that began to engender uh, a, a, a sense uh, of, of, you know, of, of, of affection, uh, the same way that they had affection for FDR and the same way they had affection for, uh, for John Kennedy. But I still think his legislative program would have passed. But he passes tax cuts. He passes budget cuts. Um, he, is, uh, he refuses to meet with the Soviets, which in itself was a strategy. He didn't meet with the Soviets for the first three years of his presidency because Carter, you know, had 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 really uh, scared the American people with Salt II and with his famous or infamous or you know remember his kiss with Bro, you know the, with the with Brezhnev and and so Reagan quite deliberately didn't meet with the Soviets for the first three years of his presidency because he wanted to send the Soviets a message that it was a new day uh, is that. Um, he did suffer a big setback in 82 with Tefra, and he always regretted that. That was a deal he made with uh, Tip O'Neill, uh, but O'Neill snookered him. You know, Reagan, they were, they were concerned about the deficit. So uh, the tax fundamental action, whatever it was, uh, is that Tip O'Neill concocts this $100 billion tax increase and says to Reagan, says, look, if you sign this, for every $1 in tax increase, the Congress will pass $3 in spending cuts. Reagan goes along with it uh, and suffers a, a setback on the first go-around because it goes down to defeat. And the opposition is in, similar to the Freedom Caucus now. There, was the, there were the conservative, uh, they used to call them Reagan robots uh, yeah. in the House. Uh, but it was led by uh, 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 Jack Kemp, Bob Walker, Newt Gingrich who were fighting against Reagan over the tax increase of TEFRA, and they won on the first go-around. Reagan won on the second go-around. But even so is, is that he never made another deal with O'Neill. You know, this idea that, that the O'Neill, you know, uh, uh, Chris Matthews, you know, puts out this myth that, that, that O'Neill and Reagan were frat brothers and they were drinking buddies and they used to double date and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's all nonsense. It's just, it's, all, it's all, it, Reagan, regarded Tip O'Neill very, very cautiously. O'Neill hated Reagan, and he wrote so in his book, Man of the House, in his autobiography. He devoted an entire uh, uh, chapter 
to just trashing Reagan, saying he was the worst president of his lifetime, it was a sin he was elected president, Nancy Reagan is the uh, queen of Beverly Hills. I mean, he just, he went on. It was very gratuitous and very personal. So this idea that they were, they didn't do the 86 uh, uh, Tax Reform Act. Reagan did that with Dan Rostenkowski, not with Tip O'Neill. O'Neill was getting ready to retire anyway. So um, is that... Uh, don't believe the mythology that's put out by Washington and the status quo is that, well, Tip O'Neill and Reagan used to sit down and have a beer together, work things out. That's all nonsense. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just remembering now the TEFRA. It's a Tax, Equity, and Fiscal Responsibility Act. Yeah, well done. Yeah, yeah well see? done. I knew something that Craig didn't. <laughs> uh, let me, I, in just a minute, I'd like to turn it to the audience and, and so be thinking of your question if you can. Uh, uh, but one thing I want, you had referenced, uh, Craig, something like over a thousand radio addresses. 1,006, five minute commentaries. 1,006 commentaries by President Reagan, uh, nationally syndicated radio uh, talk. Yes, talk. all over, yeah. Uh, do you think that, uh, I mean, how important was that to extremely. staying in touch with the American it, people in that it, time frame? It's extremely important. Reagan was almost ubiquitous at this time because not only he's got his daily radio commentary. Now, imagine this. It's five-minute commentary. It's a five-minute script. And he used to go literally to a radio studio at the corner of Hollywood and Vine, um, you know, and... Uh, where you know he said I was uh, you know Schwab's on a stool and got discovered. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> but he would, there was a, t Harry O'Connor was a was a radio producer in the um, and in fact, in fact I think Harry's still uh, uh, still alive, um, but he's long retired. But Reagan would write these scripts, and you know is that in the old you know there was no internet where you just push a button you send out a, a radio commentary to a thousand radio stations. They had to be sent out on either reel to reel tape or. A, a 45 record, a 45 uh, a record album would be pressed and then sent out. Oof. You know, and, and radio stations would play it either as a 45 uh, or as as a reel-to-reel -reel tape. But these were sent out to hundreds and hundreds of radio stations that wanted to, you know, to, wanted to run them and, and then sell ad time to local sponsors. So it all worked, you know, because money would accrue back to Hannaford and Deaver and then to Harry O'Connor and, and and Reagan. Obviously, he, he made money off the radio commentaries. Um, but uh, the uh, but because of the timing involved, he would do he wouldn't go just to a Connor studio and do one radio commentary. He'd go there and do maybe as many as twenty. All he wrote himself, uh, and they would then be they would be you know pressed. But you couldn't do things. You, you had to do things kind of almost thematically instead of topical because by the time it was broadcast, the issue may have passed. So it had to be a long-standing dispute like. Like Panama Canal went on for months, so he did a number of radio commentaries on that. Uh, is that uh, the fight over um, uh, you know Carter's energy uh, Department of Energy went on for a long time, so he did a number of radio commentaries about that. But so you had to have a keen sense of current events because you have to think, okay, I'm recording this now, but in three weeks in a broadcast, it may may be gone as an issue. So I have to be very careful about what I say. So, the, but not only is he. Uh, doing the radio commentaries. He's also got a twice a week column uh, in hundreds of newspapers around the country that's, that's syndicated by King Feature. He is giving 13 to 20 major policy speeches a month, everything from, you know, from uh, conservatives to uh, World Affairs Council to uh, conservative groups, Republican groups. He is uh, testifying before Capitol Hill on the Panama Canal Treaties. Um, he is going on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Reagan is ubiquitous. He's everywhere. Uh, and, but, he's, but he's constantly talking to the American people. And I think this is absolutely invaluable uh, for his eventual run for president because they know who he is. They know what he stands for. Uh, they like him. They respect him. And so he always had a well, a, a base of support of the American people that you could always count on uh, that would always be there you know, for whatever fight came up. Uh, either running it for president or later as president. That's, thank you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, if you've got a question, uh, please just uh, we'll start over here. Yes, ma'am. I would just like to know what was the relationship between Newt Gingrich? I know he was a speaker and he played a large role in pushing. Uh, I was asking, what was the unreported relationship between Newt Gingrich and Reagan? Oh, it was good. 
it was very good, um, is that even over uh, Tefra, it never got personal, uh, is that they uh, got together afterwards. Um, and the truth be told, you know, Bob Michael was the House Minority Leader, but he was getting on in years, and, and he really, you know, would rather play golf with O'Neill than fight him uh, or, or sing songs or something like this. He was not, he, he, he didn't, it's not that he didn't take his job seriously, it's just that he wasn't the fighter that, O'Neill, that uh, Gingrich was. And so in many ways, they were dismissed as Reagan's robots, as I said before. It was Bob Walker, Jack Kemp, Newt Gingrich, and some others. Dan Quayle was one of them. Uh, and they did. They carried most of Reagan's water on Capitol Hill in the in the uh, in the 1980s. You know, on aid to the Contras, uh, on SDI, on all the critical votes. It was these firebrand conservatives who were who were leading the charge. Uh, Reagan went to Georgia to campaign for uh, Gingrich. Uh, is that there, there were always very cordial relations. Um, uh, you know, I remember Reagan wrote in his diaries once about a, a, a he'd met with uh, Gingrich that day about an across the board budget freeze. And Reagan was intrigued, intrigued by the idea to get the deficit under control, but he, he was worried that a freeze would affect uh, the defense program. So he was probably going to re- reluctantly oppose it because he wanted to keep increasing defense spending. So, uh, but, it was, but it was by all accounts, and I talked to Newt a lot about this and a lot of, you know, his staff and a lot of, um, there was sometimes there were fights between the staff. Jim Baker and, and Newt got in fights occasionally, uh, publicly, you know, but, uh, but between Reagan himself and Gingrich himself, it was always very good. Yeah. Even, even over Tefra, it never got personal. Uh, another question um, uh, right over here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I wrote a paper recently for school on the uh, recent redefining of conservatism and um, how people are pointing Trump to to Ronald Reagan, namely on tariffs um, and how, you know, Reagan was for tariffs. So what's a good rebuttal for that? Because I know he wasn't and they continue to poise him as this, um, you know, nationalist. Um, so um, the, that's my question. No, 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 no. I understand what you're, exactly what you're saying. Is is that there are many different forms of American conservatism. There's there's uh, it, it, there's the neocons. There's the social conservative. There's the economic conservative. There's a the foreign policy conservative. Bless you. Uh, it, the, uh, the, the, the conservatism comes in many different forms. At the core of conservatism is a belief in the personal rights and dignity of all individuals. That freedom is tantamount. Some people put freedom less important, like neocons, and put the security of the state above it. Uh, others, like Reagan, would put the freedom of individuals as being more important than anything else. Uh, Trump does not. Trump is a populist. He's, he's conservative, but he's more populist. So, is that they consider economic issues more important than personal freedom and rights and dignity and all those other things. So in that way that Trump and Reagan would be at odds with each other because Reagan, if you look at his speeches and you look at his commentaries and you look at his interviews, is that it, they're all infused with individual privacy and rights and dignity. And, and he took action on that many, many times. Is that, you know, in 1978, um, there was a state senator here in California by the name of John Briggs. And he had put forward, uh, maybe some of you remember, it, the Briggs Amendment which would have prohibited uh, homosexuals who were out, you know, from teaching in the public schools. And uh, Briggs had seen what Anita Bryant had done on a similar issue down in Dade County and how she'd gained a lot of political currency by pushing the same restrictions in Dade County, Florida. So he came up with this idea, pushed it out there. Reagan opposed it. And he campaigned against it. Now, this is, a, this is an act of, of, of ultimate political courage. This is 1978. He's going to run again for the third time for the presidency. There is a growing contingent in the Republican Party of pro-family, pro-life, social conservatives. Phyllis Schlafly and, and uh, Jerry Falwell and so many others who wield a lot of political power and can help uh, somebody get the nomination or they can hurt somebody. Reagan wants their support, but he's not going to sacrifice his own principles on this. So he campaigns against it at the risk of losing the, so, the support of the social right. 
and it goes down to a crashing defeat. And John Briggs is asked when it's defeated, he said, why did it lose? He said, Ronald Reagan. And that was it. But he felt the principle was more important than anything else. And uh, uh, so that's just one example of, of many, many where he either took action or articulated or gave a speech or commentary or something like this. But he believed that at the core of, of America, the American Republic, was, was the freedom of the individual. Good. Thank you. Um, Yes, sir, right here. Yes, in uh, President Reagan's uh, first autobiography. In President Reagan's first autobiography. Where's the rest of me? Correct. He says uh, uh, there are th three things he learned that uh, do one in politically. One was denial, denying the reality. Second was short-sightedness, yeah. not looking to the future. And the third was recrimination. Um, and I was wondering if you... Uh, agree that that might be uh, good uh, things for the current president to be watchful for, or something, some other advice? Yeah, they're good. He's not going to do it, but they are good. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, let me just say is, is that look at how he behaved over this uh, over Obamacare. Is is that now he picked the issue, and I don't want to get too much into Trump and all that, but he picked Obama, not taxes, not anything else. He picked this issue. And I don't care if Ryan recommended it or anything else, but he's still the President of the United States. And so what happens is that the fissure is created in the House Republican Conference between those who say, well, we can amend it with, uh, with Ryan Care for 48 hours, it was called Ryan Care or whatever, or, or the, with the Freedom Caucus, uh, which is just obliterate, eviscerate, get rid of it now. And he, he chose which side he wanted to be on. And so he goes down, he, he loses, and what does he do? He starts leaking out that Ryan's to blame, Ryan needs to re replace the speaker. Uh, he, he doesn't take responsibility himself. You know, is, I don't recall any time, you know, even when Reagan didn't deserve the blame, like on Iran-Contra, you know, Ali North and Poindexter and the others deserve the blame. Uh, and yet Reagan goes on national television and takes responsibility for it, which is the same as John Kennedy did with the Bay of Pigs. You know, John Kennedy went on national television uh, and he, the, he knew it not only was the best thing to do or the most politi politically expedient, but ultimately what was best for them as president was to take responsibility. Uh, and, and this is where I think Trump is failing, is, is that he's not taking responsibility, especially for things that are his own fault. So. Well put, Craig. Um, well, over here, and then we'll come over. Craig, good to see you again. Thank you. From your book, uh, August of 76 through November of 79 when Reagan declared, was there, a, was there an epiphany moment when he said to himself, I'm going to run again? Did it happen that night from the clip we just saw? When did he decide he was running for president officially? I think the unofficial start point is Kansas City. There are several different official start points. I don't think, I didn't come across any evidence whatsoever that he and Mrs. Reagan were not going to run again in 1980. Uh, they had a meeting uh, at their house at Pacific Palisades. They had dinner with a number of old staffers that had worked on the 76 campaign uh, to basically make it clear that they were going to run for 1980. Now, don't forget, is the age is a... Was this was a week after November of 76. Okay, so, a, uh, so after the convention... After the convention after Ford loses to Carter is that about a week after they have a dinner at Pacific Palisades and they were really astonished at how unenthusiastic his former aides were is that really nobody, none of them except for the stalwarts like Knopfsinger uh, and Deaver and the others uh, the others wouldn't actually commit to Governor Reagan that they would be with him uh, for the 1980 campaign so they were they were taken aback but they were always you know, committed to running. Uh, the, I, I found no evidence whatsoever that Reagan was not going to run again. There were no self-doubts whatsoever. There were, there were doubts about the attacks on his age. Uh, he was 65 in 1976, and it's only two generations ago, but our attitude has changed dramatically. You know, here's Trump is the oldest president. And I don't recall his age ever coming up in this campaign, ever. And yet in 1980, it came up constantly with Ronald Reagan. I mean, constantly. You know, from, from Repu you know, George Bush uh, ran, of course, against Reagan. And the centerpiece of his campaign is that he's jogging all the time. 
He's jogging. You know, he's, 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 uh, you know, network cameras are reporting on him jogging. The Washington Post reporting on him jogging. The New York Times, I mean, you, you just, you know, you, you want, like, all right, enough, all right. <laughs> you know, d say something to, besides just the jogging. Uh, but it was all to exacerbate the age issue with, with Reagan. Uh, so, but our, but, our, but our attitude, you know, medicine has changed, health has changed, diet has changed, and our attitudes about age have changed now in just, a, in just two generations. But it was the issue of 1980. Um, and uh, actually, I think in a way, it made Reagan angry because he knew he was not too old. He knew he had the capacity. He knew he was just getting to the peak of his powers. And it made him campaign even harder. There was one situation where they, he, he went to, after losing the Iowa caucuses to George Bush unexpectedly in 1980, the New Hampshire primary takes place five weeks later, which was Reagan's saving grace. Because if it happened one week later the way it does now, he most likely would have lost New Hampshire to Bush, and that, that, that would have been it. Uh, the Republicans would have nominated George Bush in 1980. But he has five weeks to resuscitate his campaign. And he just plants himself there. He's just going to campaign there. And the campaign aides are saying, oh, Governor, you've got to go to North Carolina. You've got to go to Florida. You've got to go to Texas. He said, no, I'm staying here. I'm campaigning here. And he went out for one day, you know, 10, 12, 14 hours, something like this. And the press bus that was following him, they hung up a sign that says, free the Reagan 44. You know, he was, he was driving guys who were half his age into the ground. So, um, but there was, this... I, I like that from his, uh, from his uh, autobiography. I'd forgotten that. He had enormous self-confidence. Uh, I'm not sure that Trump has that type of self-confidence. He once told a, a reporter with the New York Times during the 80 campaign, um, he, he said that um, he said there's not just the, the feeling that one can be president, but a feeling that one should be president. I mean, that's the so type of self-confidence that he had about himself. Great. Um, we're out of time. Um, it's gone fast. Uh, Craig, I, uh, on behalf of everyone here, I want to thank you for coming and making this uh, one of the spots that you, uh, you visit each time that you come forward with a terrific book like this. So I just want to say thank you and thank you. Uh, tell you how much we appreciate it. If you thank, you, me. Thanks. thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we invite you all to stay for the book signing with Craig Shirley. The line will form back here in the back of the room. And thank you so much for coming out this evening. Great.